Well, um, good morning, everyone. Um, Brexit has certainly brought many new experiences into my life, and I've never before in my entire life given a member of the Conservative and Unionist Party a standing ovation. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I've just done so twice in the last 15 minutes, and I suspect so far as Dominic is concerned, it, it may not um, be uh, the last time. Um, it's really interesting for me to be here today at, at this event where we're discussing not just Brexit, but the political future of these islands and the constitution of what is at present the United Kingdom. Uh, my friend and, and comrade from the independence referendum, the distinguished Scottish journalist Leslie Riddick is here and she'll be speaking later. And I've just sent uh, Leslie a message to say, I think the English are now having their, the summer of love that we had back in 2014 before our independence referendum, by which I mean is a, is a flowering of thought and politics on the left, but also bringing in some people from the right and a discussion about, about the future of the nations of, the, of these islands. But I want to say a bit about Scotland's position in all of this, because you know that Scotland voted to remain uh, by 62%, and the city of Edinburgh, part of which I represent, voted to remain by 75%. And um, polls in Scotland now show that if and when there is a second referendum, the remain vote in Scotland is like, likely to be up there at 70%. And I'm very proud that the Scottish National Party, which is the second biggest political party in these islands by membership, is the first, has been the first major party to say that it would support a second vote uh, on uh, the EU. And I'm also very excited that the polls across the UK seem to be moving towards the idea of Remain and moving towards the idea that we should have a second EU referendum. But I want to make it clear that that doesn't change the commitment of people like myself to uh, the cause of independence for Scotland. And I don't think the two things are incompatible because I believe that an independent Scotland's interests are best served by a stable England, Ireland and Wales, not a society and economy in the sort of meltdown that we can expect uh, after Brexit. And I'm going to say something a bit unexpected for a Scottish nationalist. I'm very happy to be in a union with England, but I want it to be a union of equals. I want Scotland to be a member of the European Union, an independent Scotland alongside England, so that we can finally be in a union of equals. Now, it's really, not everyone in Scotland holds that view yet, but probably about half the population do, and I hope to persuade more. But what does really unite us across those who campaigned for independence and those campaigned to remain part of the UK back in 2014, what unites most of us is a desire to remain part of the European Union. And the idea of a second referendum is supported in Scotland by the Liberal Democrats and the Greens, of course, but it's also supported by many Scottish uh, Labour politicians. And I think it's really important for uh, English audiences to appreciate that the Tory revival in Scotland has been greatly ex exaggerated. The Tory party is still very much in the minority in Scotland, and the Scottish Parliament, by a majority of 90 votes to 30, supports the idea of Scotland staying in the European Union. So it's only the Tories and one a maverick rogue Lib Dem who are happy with the idea of Brexit in Scotland. And the Tories really only represent between about 25 and 30% of opinion in Scotland at their absolute uh, zenith. So Scotland is indeed a, a very different uh, country. And I've thought a lot about why Scotland uh, voted to remain when England uh, didn't. And I'm not going to insult Leave voters because I think it's very important not to do that. Because it seems to me that a lot of the reason why Scotland voted to remain and England didn't is the benefits of devolution for Scotland. Because for the last 20 years, Scotland has benefited from left of centre social democratic governments. First of all, a Labour Lib Dem, coalition and for the last 11 years the Scottish National Party and in particular those last 11 years of SNP government have shielded Scotland from some not all but some of the worst consequences of austerity policies it's a matter of record that the NHS in Scotland while far from perfect is the best run NHS in these islands and Scotland unlike England is building very significant quantities of social housing 
We have groundbreaking anti-homelessness legislation and we've reintroduced security of tenure in the private rented sector. And I think... Uh, I think, I think these, these aspects of devolution are part of the reason why Scots didn't feel the need to kick the establishment in the way that Leave voters in England did. Because I notice when I travel, not so much in the major cities of England, but in provincial England, I notice that the infrastructure is poor. And I know fine well that it's very difficult to get social housing in these areas. And I think many working class people in England have been led to believe that the cause of their woes, the reasons they can't get a job, or the reason they can't get a well-paid job, or a secure job, or the reason they can't get a social housing tenancy, is because of immigrants. When it's not the fault of immigrants at all, it's the fault of toxic austerity policies. <laughs> now, Speaking as someone who represents a Scottish constituency and as someone who's lucky enough to have an Irish mother and be getting an Irish passport shortly, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've thought a lot about what Brexit tells us about the difference between Scotland's position in the United Kingdom and Ireland's position in the European Union. Because back in 2014, before the independence referendum in Scotland, those who wished Scotland to remain part of the UK told us repeatedly that we were an equal partner in the Union. But it's become very clear as a result of Brexit uh, that that is not the case. I very much look with envy at the way in which uh, Ireland's interests have been central to the Brexit process, right up there at the centre of the negotiating procedure, whereas Scotland's interests have been utterly uh, marginalised within uh, the United Kingdom. And I was very interested recently uh, at an event to hear the distinguished, distinguished professor of modern history at University College Dublin, Professor Mary Daly, comment that the current situation at Westminster is very reminiscent of what was going on at Westminster 100 years ago, when, as she described it, the electric politics of Ulster uh, dominated what was going on at Westminster. And even though Northern Ireland only has DUP representatives at Westminster, who uh, actually don't speak for the majority on Brexit, uh, the concerns of Ireland and indeed of Northern Ireland have been very central uh, to uh, the Brexit process. But if we look at what has happened in Scotland, it becomes starkly uh, obvious that although devolution might have prevented some of the worst excesses of austerity in Scotland, devolution is not able to protect Scotland from Brexit. Right at the beginning, the Scottish Government put forward the idea of a, a deal or a differentiated deal for Scotland or a deal that would keep the whole of the UK in the single market and the customs union. It wasn't looked at at all by the British Government. The British Government cut the Scottish Government out of the Brexit negotiations completely. The Scottish Parliament voted with cross-party support, everyone apart from the Tories on one Lib Dem, Lib Dem to withhold consent to the European Union withdrawal bill, that was ignored. When the Scottish Parliament tried to pass its own European Union withdrawal bill called the Continuity Bill, it was challenged by the British government in the courts and while the court challenge was pending, the British government in the House of Lords amended the withdrawal bill to retrospectively make the Scottish bill ultra vires. And when those amendments came back to the floor of the House in the Commons, Scottish MPs got 19 minutes to debate those amendments and the whole 19 minutes was taken up by the UK government minister speaking. We didn't get to speak at all apart from the odd intervention. And that's what prompted our famous walkout. And when we finally got the withdrawal agreement, Scotland wasn't mentioned at all. Nothing about Scotland in the withdrawal agreement or the political declaration, while little Gibraltar, and I accept that Gibraltar's position is important and concerning, Gibraltar, the Gibraltar government were afforded advance sight of the agreement, but the Scottish government just got it at the same time as the rest of us. So Brexit's told Scottish voters a lot about the reality of a devolution and the truth that power devolved is power retained. But I think there's still a bit of hope for Scotland and it comes from the cross-party working that we've seen in the Scottish Parliament as I've described and also as Dominic talked about at Westminster this week. And that cross-party working I think was exemplified by the group of politicians of which I was proud to be part 
who took the case to Luxembourg to get the ruling that Article 50 can be unilaterally revoked. And that was... Um, that, that, that was... Uh, my two SNP parliamentarians, two Labour parliamentarians, uh, two Green parliamentarians, and the very excellent Joe Mon and English Silk who did that. So that was very much cross-party working. And of course, Chris, Le Chris Leslie and Tom Brake came on board later on uh, to support us. So it's been Scottish politicians that have thrown Westminster the lifeline it needs to be able to unilaterally revoke Article 50 and stay in the European Union on the terms that we currently enjoy. And to achieve that, we're going to have to work cross-party. And I believe that what ultimately may be required is a temporary cross-party government to seek an extension of Article 50, hold a second referendum, and then revoke Article 50 before, before holding a general election to elect a new government. And this is something that's been talked about. <clears throat> This is something that's been talked about by commentators, particularly commentators in Scotland, including my friend and colleague Leslie Riddick, who will be speaking later, and also Dr. Kirsty Hughes, the director of the Scottish think tank, the Scottish Centre on European Relations. They've both talked about the possibility of a cross-party executive to deliver us from the hands of Brexit. And I would like the SNP to take their rightful place in such an arrangement as the third party in Westminster, but for that to happen, two things would have to be recognised. First of all, it would need to be recognised that Scotland's interests must move from the back seat to the front seat, and that Scotland's interests must be treated equally along those of, alongside those of England, Northern Ireland and Wales. And I don't think that should be too difficult to do. The other thing that would require to be acknowledged is the fact that the Brexit process has in Scotland created a mandate for a second independence referendum. And the Scottish Parliament has voted to hold a second independence referendum. And so any cross-party government would require to look very seriously at giving the Scottish Parliament the means to hold a legitimate constitutional second independence referendum when the Scottish Parliament judges that the time is right. Because SNP MP votes at Westminster will be vital and to date, we've been a pivotal part of the cross-party working that's led to the defeats of the government, such as we saw earlier uh, this week. We've shown the SNP that we can work in the interests of all the nations in these islands. And I'm quite sure if there is a second vote, Scotland will vote to remain again. And I really, really, really hope that England will vote to remain as well. But if England doesn't vote to remain, Scotland must be permitted to hold a second independence referendum. And of course, the precedent for a second vote where circumstances have changed will have been set. And I also know that next time Scotland votes for independence, we'll have a far more sympathetic ear from the other uh, European nations. Because I think back in 2014, some people were led to believe mistakenly that what was going on in Scotland was part of the populist movement rather than a left of centre social democratic movement eh, for change and a legitimate desire for self-determination. And I was very pleased recently when the Spanish foreign minister conceded that if Scotland leaves the UK constitutionally, he won't veto Scotland's eh, membership of eh, the European Union. But, but I want to be very clear I really hope that all the nations of the UK will change their mind about Brexit and take the escape route afforded by Scottish politicians uh, by uh, Article 50 and that we will all remain in the European Union. However, I believe that even if we do, the Brexit process has revealed that devolution is not working for Scotland that Scotland is not an equal member of the United Kingdom and that what Scotland needs going forward and also what will benefit England is for Scotland to be an equal partner in the European Union. And I very much look forward to the day when Scotland and England sit side by side at the top table in Europe and work together to better conditions across these islands and across Europe. Thank you.